giving you basically a list of things that will definitely appear. That is not to say that these are the only ones that will appear, right? So you know what's going to be on the exam. So uh, with that said, let's go ahead and start. And again, for those of you who are taking a review, I mean, yeah, I'll put yeah. it on YouTube. Again. Yeah, whoever, right? Okay. And then send me the link. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, uh, and uh, you know, the, uh, just in case you haven't, you know, gone through the whole material, you will notice that there are some that I did not lecture. In fact, I only lectured on eleven. Because 9, 12, and 13, well, 9 is really a review from Bio 1. 12 and 13 are fairly you know, uh, uh, easy. And in fact, it, I know it's easy because I'm not going into the more complicated part. So that's why I've posted the PowerPoint. And uh, you should be able to you know, study that and then back along. You don't have to you know, look at any other stuff besides uh, With the DNA uh, structure, let's start with that one. And again, one final note before we start is that I will ask you questions as if you are ready to take the exam, right? So don't feel bad if you can't answer all of them. But I stand by this assertion. Feel bad if you can't answer any of them. Right? Because we're, you know, we're well into the, the process. Okay, so DNA structure. The, there will be uh, equal numbers of concepts and then problems. So I'll give you some examples of concepts and then we'll work out a few problems. Right, some examples of concepts would be as simple as, you know, for example, let me start out with one that's moderately hard. Uh, uh, true or false? Remember, oh, the, the, the format is the same, by the way. The format is the same. You have 50 questions, 40 that are A, B, C, D, E style, and then 10 that are true or false. You'll still be divided into two sections, 1051, 1061. So, uh, true or false? A nucleoside is bigger than a nucleotide. True or false? False one. Right, exactly. A nucleoside. Now, you are, you're not responsible for structures, like drawing out structures. You are expected to know that the nucleoside is the sugar and the base. You add a phosphate to it, it becomes a nucleoside. Right? You do have to know, the, you know what are the purines, what are the pyrimidines. Right? You do have to know that you know, a purine is a double ring, a pyrimidine is a single ring. You do have to know complementary base pairs. You know, that, that's clear. You have to know what is directionality, right? So what is the directionality in DNA? It is five, five prime, three prime. What does five prime mean? You have a three, and then we all said, you have a phosphate, and the three prime is the three hydroxyl, right? You have to know what is anti-parallel, right? You have to know, um, you know, uh, this is really it as far as, oh, what's the difference between DNA and RNA, right? RNA has, um, uracil instead of thymine DNA uh, is usually double stranded. RNA can assume single stranded structures. You have ribose instead of deoxyribose, right? Uh, I mean, going back to the true false, here's another one. Uh, true or false, uh, the DNA, the sugar in DNA is bigger than the sugar in RNA. Bigger as far as size. The sugar in DNA is bigger than the sugar in RNA. And that's false one. Because the sugar in RNA, I'm sorry, it, it is, uh, uh, I forgot to say if, it's, if it's bigger or smaller. Let me rephrase so that I remember it vividly. So the question is, which is the true or false? The sugar in DNA is bigger than the sugar in RNA. And that is false, why? Because the sugar in DNA is what? Is deoxy. If you're removing an oxygen, it can't be bigger, right? Even though we're talking about micro, nanoscale, if you will. It is not true. It is smaller because it has less oxygen, right? So let's do a few problems, and then let me start with one that's fairly straightforward. Um, you isolate the DNA from a double, I mean, the DNA of a bacteria, and then you are told that it is a 10% adenine, right? Uh, what is the percent of cytosine? And then we should be able to do it mentally. Then the answer is a right away. Yeah, and then a lot of us said 40%. Now why? Since it's double-stranded DNA, you know that the percentage of A would equal to the percentage of T. So that takes out 20%, right? What's left is 80 divided by 2, 40%. Then one have a problem with that? Okay, now I can ask you the same example in a different way, same material, just in a different uh, format. Um, so let's change it. Now let's make it harder. So uh, 
Uh, well, it's not really harder. Let me just use the same, just different format and then go to a harder question. Uh, let's just write out a few bases. So here's here's the oh sure. Percentage of A, let's say, is 10. Uh, this is 30. This is 20. This is 0. And this is 40. Uh, and then here's your P. Single-stranded DNA. Single-stranded RNA. Double-stranded DNA. And double-stranded RNA. So, and I can give you, you know, several different molecules. Uh, which category would this fell, right? If you have given these, which one is the answer? Is it single or double, single or double RNA? Right, so why is it RNA first? Because it has uracil methine, right? So automatically you've ruled out the DNA and it has to be single-stranded, why? Because if it was double-stranded, what would you expect? You would expect the A to be equal to what? To the U, and the G equal to the C, they're not. So it has to be single-stranded RNA. Don't have a problem with that. Okay, now, here's, uh, here's another one, okay? You isolate the DNA of a, again, of a bacteria. Now this is a little bit harder. And you're told that the percentage of adenine on one strand, on one strand is 10%. What is the percentage of adenine in the entire molecule? <clears throat> if you're told that the percentage of adenine on one strand is 10%, what is the percentage of adenine in the entire molecule? It's an open-ended question. What will be the answer? Exactly, you can't tell. Knowing one strand, you can't tell both strands. So then I'll tell you, okay, well, we calculated the percentage of thymine on the same strand, and then found out it's 20%. What is the percentage of adenine in the entire molecule? Is that enough? It's still not enough, right? What do I need? What do I need to be enough again? You said the percent of Exactly, I need the thymines on this strand, right? Because if I know the thymines on this strand, I know the adenines on the other strand, and then I average them up, right? So does anyone follow the logic? Again, please stop me if it's not making sense. This is a little bit harder, because knowing one strand will not give you both strands unless you know everything about the first strand. Right? So here's basically how we solve this type of problem. So I would put strand one here. Strand number one and then <coughs> strand number two. So if I know that the A here is 10%, it's still not enough. And I was told the C is 20%, it's still not enough. And then I'll give you the G is 30%. Is still, is that enough? That's gotta be enough, why? Because I know now that T has to be what? 40%. Please stop me if it's not making sense. So now I've established that the T has to be 40%. And look at that, now it's pretty straightforward. The A on this strand has to be equal to what on the other strand? Right, the percentage of T. A here is equal to 10% T. C here is equal to 20% G. G here is equal to 30% C, and then finally T is equal to 40% A, right? So true or false, the final answer is 50%. The percentage of adenine on both strands is 50%. And someone said, someone whispered, 
It's not true, why? If you use that logic, use that logic. A is 50%, G is 50%, C is 50%, and T is 50%. Now you're at 200%, doesn't make any sense. So the total is what? The average, it's not the total, it's the average, right? It's basically 50% divided by two, 25%. Actually, this is a weird one where all of them are gonna be 25%. You're not gonna get that a lot. Does anyone see the answer? So the answer is actually 25%. Here's another way, and that's the beauty of, frankly, genetics, is a lot of it is common sense, right? As long as you know basic, obviously, information, you know that A bonds to T, C bonds to G. So create a fictitious molecule that satisfies your condition, right? I want a molecule that is 10% A. 10% means one in 100, right? Sorry, 10%. 10 in 100. So I'm not gonna create 100 molecule, I mean 100, I'm just gonna create 10, because it's easy. So 10% of 10 is one. So this is 10% adenine, this is 20% cytosine, this is 30% guanine, and 40% thymine. And now I'm gonna create the other strand. All right, that means it's four A's, one T, two G's, three C's. How many A's are, there are five divided by 20, right? There's five A's divided by a total of 20, which is 25%. Questions about this side? Okay, so here's another style of question. I'm gonna spend a little bit more on nine because that's really where most of the calculations lie. Uh, the others are, you know, fairly straightforward. Let's do another uh, style of question. Then you're asked to determine distance, right, or base pair. So for example, let's use the same analogy. You're isolating the DNA from a bacterium, and you're told that, uh, or you measure it, or someone measures it, and tells you that it is 68 microns. 68 micrometers in length. Again, this is the double-stranded DNA of a, uh, an unknown or of a bacterium. And it comes out to be 68 micrometers in length. How many base pairs is that? Don't know how to, or anyone want to tackle that. How can we go from a measure of distance to a measure of base pairs, to a number of base pairs? Now remember, the fact that it's isolated from DNA tells you what form of DNA is that. Anyone remember from chapter nine? There are multiple forms of DNA. There's the A DNA, there's the B DNA, and there's actually many, but I'm only discussing three. A, B, and then the what? The Z, the Z DNA, right? The Z DNA is the only one that's left-handed, meaning it goes counterclockwise. And it's the only one that has a zigzag pattern, that's why it's called Z. The other ones are a helix. That, you, that is what you have to know about the Z DNA. For the B DNA, you have to know everything, which is, the turn is what? Then it, the, the thickness is two nanometers, and every turn is what? Sorry? 10 base pairs, but what is it in distance? 3.4 nanometers. That's all you need, right? That's all you need. You need 10, 10 base pairs is equal, corresponds to 3.4 nanometers. Now you might not see it this way, but it absolutely is. This is one of the first things you've learned as a student, right? If you remember way back in middle school, well not middle school, kindergarten even. Um, Johnny, I mean, a burger costs $2, and Johnny has $20. How many burgers can Johnny buy, right? You can do the math there. That's exactly what I'm doing here. 10 base pairs corresponds to 3.4 nanometers. What, I'm sorry, this is 68, yeah. 68 micrometers is equal to X, right? This is the burger, right, and this is the money. You're not calculating the number of burgers. Now, the, the, obviously, these are different numbers, so a value, so I have to convert them to the same. Right? So how do I do that? A micrometer is how many nanometers? Now, you have to know the metric scale, right? We have a meter. If we go to a, a 10 to the third, it's now a kilometer. If we go under, it's now a millimeter, micrometer, nanometer, if you go by powers of three. So really, a micrometer is a thousand nanometers, right? So this is basically, you just multiply by a thousand. So 
So 68 micrometers is really 68,000 nanometers, and you solve for x. x is going to be 68,000 times 10 divided by 3.4. You can do it whichever way you want. You can do it by calculators or whatever, but basically you remove the minus. I mean, I mean not the minus. If you remember um, your fraction, if you remove the decimal here, you actually have to multiply by 10, right? Because I'm multiplying both sides by 10. So the answer would be 68 by 34 is 2. So the answer is 200,000 base pairs. No. Yeah, 200,000 base pairs. Let's see. Now here's a hint. If you work out the math and then you get decimals, right, and you get weird numbers like 6, 7, 8, 9.623, you're way off. I'm going to ask it to you that you're going to get a round number like this. 2,000, 400,000, 2 million, 1.5 million maybe, but you're not going to get weird uh, numbers. Questions about this? Okay, so here's the question, or here's another question. How many turns is that? How many turns of the helix is that? 20,000, right? Because remember, every 10 base pairs is one turn. So having 200,000 is 20,000 turns. Okay, so let me uh, work out another type of problem. One that involves probability. So here's the, here's, I'll have to give you the key, right? Uh, and is any nucleotide R is any purine and Y is any pyramid so so N is any nucleotide R is any purine and Y is any pyramid and then here's the sequence 5 prime Use one that I can grab. So the sequence is granny, mm -hmm. and here is what you need to know. This is a random sequence, and the bases are found equally. So there's an equal number of C's and T's and G's and A. That means they're all 25%. Mm -hmm. So here's here's the question: How often? What is the probability that you're given a DNA, you close your eyes and you point to a sequence and it is granny? Mm -hmm. What is the probability of finding granny in any DNA that is random and assuming equal percentages, right? Here, we have to use the laws of probability. What is, forget about the ra and granny now, just now focus on the G. What is the likelihood that you see a G in any piece of DNA that I just described? Right? One out of four, 25 percent. One out of four. What is the probability of finding an R? Sorry? Two out of four, right? Because now you have two purines. You have the favorable is two, the total is four. Remember, if it's hard, probability is very easy. It's the number of favorable divided by the total. Favorable here is two, total is four. So really, two out of four, or one out of two. What about A, one out of four? We've already established that, one out of four, not six. What about N? N is one out of one. Anything works. Four out of four, anything works, right? So four out of four, four out of four, one out of two out of four, right? And then here, I'm just putting it to know how we're gonna simplify it, right? This is now one out of two, this is now one, this is now one out of two, and then now what do you do? You add them, true or false. You add them, true or false. Why false? In fact, even if you forgot that it's the end rule of probability, add them, you're gonna get more than 100%. It just doesn't make any sense. You can't get a more than 100% for a sequence. You have to multiply them, it's the end rule. It's this times this times that times this times that. 
questions about nine? Okay, so nine, that's pretty much it. Um, 11 is the biggest chapter, single chapter in this sequence. And 11 deals with DNA replication. And again, there will be an equal number or good number of concepts and uh, problems. For conceptual, you do have to know what is a polymerase. What are the types of polymerases? What do polymerases, what can polymerases not do? Um, what does the origin of replication mean? What does the terminus mean? Uh, what is the mode of replication called in bacteria? The Greek letter, Sorry? No, not sigma. Sigma is actually used, but that is in, in transcription. It's the theta or theta mode of replication because it, it looks like the Greek letter theta or theta, right? Because you have now a replication fork and you have what's called the I. So it's called the theta mode of replication. Uh, true or, fa or false, bacteria have a single origin of replication. True, because usually in a circle you only have one origin. Uh, the mode of replication is bidirectional. True, right? Because it starts, it goes to the right, and it goes to the left, and then it meets at the um, at the terminus. Um, you do not have to know the exact sequence, okay? even though I mentioned what is the OEC. You do have to know uh, structurally. Okay? So we talked about the DNA boxes. We've talked about you know the thirteen repeat segment. I'm sorry, the thirteen sequence segment, thirteen MERS, as they're called. Um, so let me just ask you a question about this. It actually um, overlaps with, with chapter nine. Uh, so in general, true or false, right? in general, origins of replications are rich with guanines and cytosine. True or false, origins of replications are GC rich. Now you'd expect that to be false, why? Exactly, GCs are tougher to break, right? They're triple bonded. Most, in fact, not most, all origins of replications are AT rich because these are thermodynamically weaker. They can easily open up. So remember, the, the more ATs, the weaker the DNA. The more GCs, the stronger the DNA because they're triple bonded. Even though they're weak, three is more than two, right? So, uh, so yeah, these are things you, you do have to know. Now, you will get, for sure, three or four questions on the Messerschmitt and Stahl experiment. And that is the one that, for those of you who haven't got, well, no, you should have, because that's the old module, or the older module. So I do have tutorials on the Messerschmitt and Stahl, where you, know, you use the lecture notes, and then you know, fill in. Uh, but this is a key uh, component of this exam. It's three or four questions on the Messerschmitt and Stahl. Now, the questions will not be about how you carry it out. I will tell you how it's carried out. I expect you to know how to interpret the results. And that's what we're going to do, okay? So again, if you've done it, good for you. You would be uh, able to test yourself on it. If you haven't or you forgot it, please go back and review it well. I'm gonna go through a power review of the material. And the basic premise behind the Messerschmitt and Stahl experiment is uh, by that time, the DNA had been discovered. The structure of the DNA had been uh, worked out. And the key was to figure out how it replicates. And there are three models of replication that were proposed. There is the conservative, well, there is the Watson and Crick model, which was the semi-conservative model. And the semi-conservative model was pretty straightforward. And the idea, this is your DNA, the DNA opens up. And then you put new DNA here, you put new DNA here. So at the end, you're gonna have semi-conservative. Half old, half new, half old, half new. That's semi-conservative. But in reality, in fact, if you are, you could argue it's actually easier, it makes more sense to have conservative, right? Where conservative, basically, you have this gets replicated and it keeps it and while <laughs> keeping the other one separate. So basically, this opens up, it replicates, but at the end, you have two that are single strands new and two that are single strands old. So that is called conservative. You're conserving and you're making new. Semi-conservative is half and half. And the least likely, or you, would, you, could, you could argue, is the dispersive, uh, where you know, each strand is half old, half new. Not you know, the molecule, each strand itself is half old, half new. Because that requires the breakage of bonds, which you, know, you could argue is the least likely. But still, it's a possibility. So what Messerson and Stahl uh, devised, and it has been described 
It has been described as the most beautiful experiment in biology. They devised a very simple experiment. It took them years, really, to devise this simple experiment. But they figured out a way how to tell apart these various models. And the premise is very simple. I'll set it up for you. Um, you start out with what's called heavy DNA. And heavy DNA is N15. Now, I'm not going to ask you about isotopes and numbers of this and numbers of that. It's the heavy DNA. The regular DNA is N14. So the way they set up this experiment is very straightforward. They exposed E. coli to a medium that only contains heavy DNA. So, and they allowed it to replicate for many, many generations to ensure that all of its DNA is heavy. There's no DNA except the N15 variety. It's called heavy DNA. And at that point, they moved E. coli into a new medium where all the DNA now is light. It's N14. So every time the DNA gets to be replicated, the only DNA that's going to be new is the N14. So the heavy DNA is what you start the experiment with. Everything else is going to be the light. So let's, let's back up. Let's assume, let's assume it's semi-conservative, which is the most, uh, which is the one that it worked out eventually. Let's assume it is semi-conservative. So that simple, this is the easiest one to frankly draw out. Because all you need to do is put new DNA in red, let's say, and put it right there. That's your new DNA, right? So at the end of the experiment, uh, one round that is, what do you get? You get two molecules, right, that are half old, half new. 14.5. Does anyone have a problem with that? Okay. And let's say we were to spin it in a ultra uh, centrifuge. Okay. Density gradient centrifugation. I'm not going to expect you to know the, the molarity of cesium chloride or does contain cesium chloride to begin with. But you are expected to know how would they precipitate. Right. So um, here's our tube. Now remember, 14 is lighter, 15 is heavier. So if you were to spin it, 15 will go to the bottom, 14 will stay on top, and 14.5 will basically form in the middle. Right? So if you spin these in this tube, right, how many bands would you expect? One, because these are exactly the same molecule. They're exactly the same molecule, they're exactly the same density. So you would form only one band, which is right in the middle. This is where N14 would have been. This is where 15 would have been. You only form one line. Okay? Does anyone have a problem with that? Okay, so let's take it another generation. Let's take it one more generation. Okay, let's take it one more generation. Now remember, this is semi-conservative. Right? Semi-conservative. So using letters, using colors, we're going to get how many lines? Well, we're not using colors. Using lines. How many lines are we going to get? We're going to get eight lines, right? Because each line is going to give you two, right? So here I'm going to get two, I'm going to get two, I'm going to get two, I'm going to get two. Now, which colors would you expect them to be? I'll start you off. Black, right? Followed by what? Red. Red, 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 black. Again, all you need to do, guys, is put two reds in the middle. That's your new DNA, it's all red, right? So I'm gonna get black, red, 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 black. How many bands will I get here? I'm gonna get two bands. Right? Why? Because I have two different types of molecules. I'm going to get one in the middle still, right? And where would the other be? On top. Because remember, 14 is red. 14 is the light DNA. So 15 is black, and then 14 is red. Right? So this just gives you the clue. You can do squiggly lines if you don't have a different color. The other band will be right here. Which of these bands will be thicker? will be the same thickness, right? Because they have exactly the same number of molecules. 
Now on the exam, I can't give you thickness, I can't give you brightness, I can't give you intensity of color, so I will probably give it to you as a thicker band, just to indicate that it's, you know, there's more DNA there. Does anyone have a problem with that? Here's the beauty of this experiment. Okay, let's conceptualize it. Let's say you run it 10 generations later. 10 generations later. How many bands would you expect? 10 generations later. Still two. Still two, right? The positions are exactly the same. What's the only difference? How can you tell it's after 10 or after two? The one that after 10 will have what? The top band, the top band will be thicker and thicker. Why? Because there's more molecule, right? There's more molecule. That's semi-conservative. Let's do conservative. Let's do conservative. Conservative. After one round, you get two molecules still. Only now, because it's conserved, you're going to get black, black, red, red. Right? Because it's conserved. So I'm going to get black, black, and I'm going to get red, red. OK, again, I'm going to get eight lines here. I'll start this off, and then let's figure out the color. I'll start off as black, 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 red, 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 red. Conservatively, I'm replicating this conservatively, which means that I'm going to get what I started with and new DNA. Right? Look at the next guy. I'm replicating it conservatively, which means I'm going to keep what I have and keep what I have. Because the new is old. I'm sorry, the old is new and the new is new. Right? Conservative. So, how many bands do I get on the top one? I'm going to get two bands one at 14, one at 15. Don't worry about the colors here for the band there. Just put them all in the same color. What about here? How many bands do I get? Still two, right? One at 14, and then one at 15. But what's the difference? The one at 14 is going to be what? Thicker or thinner? The one at 14. Thicker, because there's three times more of DNA. So I can't give you, you know, more intense. I'll give you a thicker band. So it's going to look something like this. They don't have a problem with that. Dispersive. Dispersive is really the, um, the in, in some ways, the easiest to conceptualize, although the hardest to draw. Uh, and dispersive is instead of getting like a full black and a full red, you get a combination of black and red in each line. So it's going to look something like this. Something like this. Something like this. How many bands will this form if you were to spin it? Still one. This is the exact same molecule, right? And it's 14.5. So it will still form one band in the middle. That's your 14.5. Now, you carry it out to a second generation and a third, etc. right? How many bands would you expect? You still expect one, but what's gonna happen as you go generation to generation? This band gets thicker for sure because there's more molecules and gets higher, lighter. Right? So you're gonna still get a band, it's just gonna get thicker and then higher. So instead of just forming here, it's gonna form you know, slightly above and then slightly above. And if you were to leave it long enough, that 14 would essentially wipe out the 15. The 15 would be so dilute, it doesn't make any difference. It's now right at 14. Okay. Now let me ask you one conceptually, numerically, okay? And if you can solve this one, then you're ready for this portion. Um, 
assuming conservative replication, okay, assuming conservative replication, and you're carrying it out, assuming conservative replication, you're carrying out a massive cell install experiment to five generations, to five generations, meaning after five generations. How many hybrid molecules would you expect? Assuming semi, sorry, assuming conservative replication, carrying it out to five generations, how many hybrid molecules would you expect? And the answer is, sorry? None. In conservative, you don't get a hybrid. That's by definition, right? Conservative, you're going to get black, black, red, red. You're never going to get black and red in the same molecule. So the answer for that one would be zero, right? Part two, what ratio of high, sorry, what ratio of heavy to light DNA would you expect? What is the ratio of hybrid to light DNA after five generations? Now the easiest way to do it is figure out first the number of total molecules, right? <laughs> after five generations, how many total DNA molecules would you expect? Yep. The ratio? Yeah. Like one to nine? One to nine. You're close, but not nine. Why nine? Nine is a weird number. You multiply by two, you're, you're almost there, right? You multiply by two every time, right? So let's do the total number first. After one generation, how many molecules would you expect? Two. Four, eight, 16, 32, right? I'm doubling every time. I'm not adding. I started out with two. 4, 8, 16, 32. Aha, uh -huh. 32 molecules. How many of these do you expect to be heavy? Only one, the one that I drew on the far left. Everything else is red. So the ratio is really one to 31 or one to 32, depending on your frame of reference, right? There's only gonna be one molecule that is heavy, everything else is gonna be light. So again, that's enough for the vessel and install experiment. There's a big tutorial. If you're still struggling, please see it. But that is the style of questions to expect. Whether it's ratios of molecules, whether it's the banding pattern, whether it's what do they look like. Uh, you are expected to know the proteins and put them in order, right? So for example, um, I do expect you to know the order of the proteins. Let me just give you an example. And again, you might not be able to solve it today, but please try to, or please do by by Saturday. Um, so let's just number a few proteins here. Um, so I'll uh, mention, for example, uh, DNA pol 1. DNA pol 3. And remember, this is bacterial trend, I mean replication. Uh, DNA A. and uh, primase. <coughs> so I mean, I can you know, add one or two more, it doesn't really matter, but just to get the idea. So these are four proteins. For this material, please know what each does and obviously put them in order, because if you know what each does, then it's easier to put them in order, right? So let's start, out of these four, which one would be the first to land on the origin? That would be DNA A because that's the one that will bind to DNA boxes. Then what happens? The helix destabilizes, it opens up, and then what comes? No, pole three can't come before what? Primase, you need primase for the primer because DNA polymerases cannot initiate replication. They can elongate, they can't initiate. So DNA A comes first, right? Helicase technically comes next, but here I indicate primase. Primase, DNA pole 3, DNA pole 1. They're not numbered according to activity, they're numbered according to discovery. DNA pole 1 was the first to be discovered. DNA pole 3 was the last to be discovered. So, um, so again, the way they set up, DNA A first, primase, pole 3, pole 1. Now, you do have to know what do they do, right? What is the role of pole 1? to remove the, well, technically not the urus, the primers, because it's not just the urosals. They have to remove the RNA primers, 
and then replaces them with DNA. You also have to know the directionality, which ones go add DNA 5 to 3, which one remove DNA 5 to 3, which one remove DNA 3 to 5. These are the polymerase exonuclease activities that I, you know, that I referenced. Please do know that, um, that part. But any questions about this style? Now let me give you another style, and again, you may not be able to do it today, but please make sure you study the corresponding material to get it uh, on Saturday. Let me give you another style of questions, right? So here's A, B, C, D. That's the key. And that's the key we're going to use. And I'll give you the key and then I'll ask you the questions. Right? A is leading strand on B. B is lagging strand on B. C is both, and D is neither. Now clearly the question is going to be which ones are used for leading only, lagging only, both, etc. I'll list a few examples and then let's try to solve them or answer them. So one, two, three, one, DNA, all three. Uh, Primase, actually, this Okazaki fragments, primates, and uh, four uh, uh, let's say six. <coughs> I mean something that I okay. So DNA pole three, which one would be the key? Which letter? Mm. DNA pole three is the one that adds the DNA bases, so both strands would be using it, right? So that would be a C answer. Uh, what about Okazaki? Okazaki fragments are only used for the lagging strand, right? That's because DNA replication has to occur in the opposite direction, right? So the Okazaki fragments are only used for the lagging. What about primase, right? Primase is one that actually puts down the primer. So this is also required for both, right? This is also required for both. What about the sigma factor? In the context of replication, it's not involved, right? This is transcription, not trans, you know, not replication. So this is, this is D. Now let me change the question uh, to a true or false. True or false, primase activity is higher on the lag, sorry, is higher on the leading than on the lagging strand. True or false? Primase activity is higher on the leading than the lagging strand. It's actually false, right? Why? Because on the leading strand, in theory, you need how many primers? One, in theory. Because once you create that first primer, DNA pole three can recognize it and replicate all the way till the end. It's a highly processive enzyme. In reality, it doesn't. It falls off and comes back right on. But in the, uh, the lagging strand, you need, essentially, every thousand base pairs, you need an Okazaki fragment. So you need another primer. So primary activity is for both, but it's highly, highly, highly more, high, more highly worked, I guess, on the lagging, not on the leading. Right. You have to know what are the third sequences, right? These are the ones that signal the end of transcription. Uh, you do have to know the, what are telomeres, that's at the end of this uh, section, eukaryotic DNA replication. Uh, you don't have to know the sequences that are the telomeres. Uh, but you are expected to know what two telomeres function, right? Um, they, have, they, they, do, they do three things, right? What are they? They protect the DNA they, from degradation, they prevent stickiness, and they also allow its replication. Right? Now that's where the enzyme telomerase comes in. Right? Uh, you have to know where telomerase is active, right? Where is telomerase active? In germline cells, right, to keep the length of the telomeres intact. In cancer cells, that's why cancer cells are immortal, right? 
uh, it's found in single cell eukaryotes, right? Yeast and protozoan, but it's not active in somatic cells. And that is one reason why we age, right? Because our telomeres keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, there are syndromes associated with short telomeres and therefore premature aging, right? What are these called? You do have to know, we discussed two of them, because I discussed two of them. These are called progeas, right? P-R-O-G-I, ah, progeria, P-R-O-G-E-R-I-A-S, right? Break it down into two words that make sense, right? Progeria, not per and ogeria. Progeria, geria refers to what? Geriatrics, right? Study of aging, old age. Pro means before. They're aging well before their time. We talked about Hutchinson, Guilford, and Werner syndrome. So these are things right you are expected uh, you know, to know. Uh, questions about any of this? Now let me go into transcription and translation, and these are you know related. Uh, one you know follows the other. You do have to know again the basic. The, the lecture notes. I'm not going to ask you about details that are in the book. Uh, so let's start with, well, so first of all, you have to know the central dogma, right? The central dogma of molecular biology. And it's fairly simple. It's DNA makes RNA, and RNA makes protein. DNA to RNA is transcription. RNA to proteins is translation. And that's one or two points on the exam right there. Um, now, and it's easy to remember them, just in case you're still confused, right? Translation is changing a language, right? You go from English to Arabic, or you know, English to Spanish, or whatever. You're translating, you're changing languages. Transcribing, you're keeping the language, but you're changing the form, right? Some of you may have worked in a, as a medical transcriptionist, right? So you take you know, the audio of the physician or the nurse practitioner, and then you type it up. You're still using English, let's say, but you're going from audio to written. You're not changing the language, you're transcribing it. Same thing with RNA and DNA. They're the same language, nucleotides. Proteins are a different language, amino acids. So we go into a translator. In fact, the translator is transcribed. That's the translator. So, okay. Uh, now, you do have to know RNA uh, polymerase D uh, in detail. So, um, in bacteria, we have one RNA, it's called RNA polymerase, and it's made up of two, right? The whole thing is called the holoenzyme. The holoenzyme, the entire enzyme. It's made up of two components, the core and the, what's the other one? The core and the signal, the signal factor. The core is alpha two, beta, beta prime, and sometimes omega. And then the sigma factor is just the Greek, one letter, the Greek letter of the sigma, which is a D on its side. You put them together, it's called the holoenzyme, right? What is the only role for sigma? Finding the promoter, right? As soon as it finds the promoter, sigma gets lost, and then the core continues all the way till the terminator, right? Uh, you do have to know the, uh, the differences between transcription and replication. Right? For example, uh, true or false. Transcription, there's only one template per G, true or false. In transcription, there's only one template per G. True, because you only transcribe one. You don't transcribe both for the same G, because obviously they're gonna be opposite to each other, complementary, and that's disastrous, because they will bind each other. Uh, in DNA replication, both serve as a template. Right? So they bind to the promoter, they start transcribing, and then they end at the terminator. And you also have to know, uh, you don't have to know the sequence of the promoter. I do expect you uh, to know what is the promoter, right? Or another question, is it true or false here? True or false, the promoter is transcribed. True or false? The promoter is transcribed. It's false. The promoter is not transcribed. The promoter is there to recognize where transcription is gonna happen, but it happens after it, downstream of it. It doesn't, transcribe it, it doesn't transcribe um, RNA polymerase. Uh, you also have to know uh, what, is, what are the terminators. We, we, in bacteria we have two types, right? We have the row dependent and then the row independent. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you beyond that. I'm not gonna ask you to recognize the actual sequence. 
but do know the difference between row dependent and row independent is, strangely enough, the dependency on row. What is row? Rho is a protein called RHO, that's row. What does rho do? There's always gonna be a send loop that forms, right? Whenever the DNA is transcribed, you're gonna have this structure, which is called a send loop. Right? It is literally a speed bump, right? literally. The RNA polymerase is too big, so it will stall onto this stem loop. If rho is required, rho will catch up and then literally bump it out, okay? may make it fall off. If rho is not required, what is usually there too? Usually there's a string of U's after the stem loop, and these U's will be bonded to A's in the DNA. Remember, U in, uh, UA is the Watson and Crick base pairing. And UNA, I did mention it in the lecture and also in the slide, well, in the slide of the lecture, I guess. Uh, this is the weakest thermodynamically uh, speaking bond. GC is the strongest, AT is next, AU is the least, the, the, the most weak. So these spontaneously fall off. They are so weak, they just spontaneously fall off and transcription ends. Um, and then the, the, you know, the chapter ends with uh, the, the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotic transcription. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the notes, you'll clearly see what I'm referring to or what I'm now referencing is I tell you that the, the details of the slides are not important. So you have to know it um, qualitatively, if you will, not quantitative. So for example, I do expect you to know the differences in polymerase. What does RNA pole one do, pole two, pole three do? Uh, I do expect you to know that in uh, RNA uh, of eukaryotes, it is long-lived. RNA of prokaryotes is short-lived. You have to know that RNA in prokaryotes is polycystronic. RNA in eukaryotes is monocystronic. Uh, I do expect to know that it is heavily trans-processed, uh, excuse me. What happens at the five prime end? It picks up a, what's the five prime end modification in mRNA? Of Sorry? It's a modified guanosine, it's called the five prime cap. At the three prime end, it picks up a poly A tail. I don't expect you to know the, the G, how the G is bonded. And in the middle, what happens? Introns are no, the other way. Introns are excised, they're surgically removed, and exons are spliced. And now it's ready to be translated. And it's also edited, which is after the fact. So usually editing involves uracil residues. Right. So again, all of this is about 10 points on the exam, right, in one form or another. But any questions about this before we go to translation? Translation is a little bit trickier. Okay, so let's finish with translation, and then I'll ask you a question at the end that will combine all of them. Um, so let's do a translation. With translation, same idea. Uh, the, you, know, the, you have to know basics, and then there will be some application problems. The basics are, uh, well, let's start with the genetic code, right? You have to know the characteristics of the code. That's, you know, one or two questions on the exam right there. <coughs> Excuse me. You are not expected to know all the code on. My, and I don't know if I reference it, reference it in this lecture, my undergraduate genetics uh, professor asked us, well, I cannot ask us, demanded that we memorize all 64 codons. I'm not gonna do that to you. Um, but you are expected to know the basic codons, right? The basic codons are the start, which is almost always what? AUG, which codes for methionine. That you have to know. You have to know the three stop signals, which are UAA, UAG, and UGA. And then you have to know the variations. The variations meaning that the code is degenerate with two exceptions. AUG is methionine and UGG is tryptophan. Other than that, you don't have to know any code on. If I do ask you to translate, I'll provide you with the code. But you are expected to know the features of the code, right? So for example, it's a triplet, meaning every three letters code for an amino acid or stop. It is written in the form of mRNA. It is degenerate, meaning more than one codon can represent the same amino acid. It is commaless, there's no commas. It is, um, uh, what else? Uh, it is biased, exactly, meaning the codons are not used equally, right? And then finally, it is nearly universal. It is not universal where every single organism has the same exact code. 
we know now really there's about 16 different codes. But it's not like every single codon is different. Usually there's a few codons that are different. So for example, AUG is methionine normally. It might be leucine. It might be a sub codon in mitochondria. But it is not universal. It is nearly, it is almost, it is not universal. Let me ask you a problem based on the code. Okay, all right, let me start with the question and then give you a problem. Okay, so we're told, or you're told, I guess, we're all told that AUG is the start, right? Here's point question one. Is it five to three, or is it three to five, or it doesn't really matter? So which one is it? Is it five prime to three prime AUG, or is it three prime to five prime AUG? No, it's actually, it's always five to three. Right? By convention, whenever you're given anything in DNA or RNA, this is the convention. Left is five, G is three. Five to three. And so that's point one. Aha, point two, which is a little bit trickier in a sense. Um, AUG is the start codon in mRNA. What is it in DNA? which is really where the code should be in the first place. Because remember, RNA comes from DNA. So if you're told that AUG, which you are, AUG is the start codon in mRNA, what is it in DNA? What is the start codon in DNA? Now your first inclination, as mine was, frankly, whenever you know, we've discussed this way back, is to start complementary you know, bases. In reality, no. It's not how you do it. If AUG is the start codon in mRNA, the start codon in DNA is what? Is A, TG, absolutely. All, this is all you need to do. This is all you need to do. Take the U and stick a T in its stead. So stop codon is UGA, TGA. Stop codon is UAA, TA. And that is simple, because the code in mRNA is given as the coding strand. This is something that you have to go back and review from uh, chapter 12. You have to know the difference between coding and non-coding strand. Whenever your mRNA code is given, it is actually given as the coding strand, which means you simply take the U's, put the T's instead. Now, if it has no U's or T's, then you can leave it alone. So if you're told, for example, triple A is leucine, Triple A is leucine, whether it's DNA or RNA. The only difference is that you change the use to it. That's the only difference, okay? So keep that in mind. Let me ask you a probability question real quick. <coughs> uh, let's say you, you, know, you isolate a, a DNA from an alien, uh, and turns out they have five bases. They don't have four bases, they have five bases. They have the same four that we've talked about, which we know, A, C, T, G, and they have a B, let's call it boson B. So they have adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and bosamine, five bases. It is still a triplet code. It is still a triplet code. How many codons does their code have? Right. So I'll give you some choices just to get us started real quick. So here are your choices. A, three times five. B, three plus five. C, three to the five. D, five to the three. E, none of the above. So again, here's the given. You have five bases, but there's still a triplet code. So what is the answer for the number of codons? Now, even if you're being logically, hopefully, you know, B doesn't make any sense. I'm just putting it to add the letter of choice, right? Does A make sense? Even A doesn't really make sense. How in the world do we come up with three times five? They have unrelated. So you're down to basically C, D, and E. How is it? Right? And at its heart, it's really, it's the angle. That's all it is. How many bases is a triplet? Three bases. So I have three choices, right? Really, I don't have three choices. I have three bases. Each can be occupied by how many different letters? Five. So this one has five. This one has five. This one has five. So what's your answer? Five times five, times five, five cubed. 
if your if all else fails, how many codons do we have normally? 64. Is 64 3 to the 4 or 4 to the 3? It's 4 to the 3. 4 times 4 times 4. Right? If on the other hand it's a quadruplet code, you throw in another 5. Right? Uh, you do have to know the structure of tRNA. Right? What is tRNA? Where is the anti-codon? Where does the amino acid bind? You have to know that part. You have to know the composition of the ribosome, the 30S, the 50S. You have to know a translation in order. You have to put the steps of translation in order. Right? Just like we talked about for DNA replication. And then for that one, just in case you, don't, uh, you haven't seen the notes yet, uh, I've referenced a, a movie actually that my class did back, shoot, 12 years ago almost. <laughs> 11 years ago. Uh, we called it Lost in Translation. Some of you may have, any of you have seen it? Oh, come on. Uh, it actually has about 120,000 hits on YouTube for a science movie that's not too bad at all. But anyway, we actually walk you through the steps of translation. Right? So when I walk you through the A, the P, the E, and then we all act it out. Um, so you do have to know this part, whether you watch our movie or you know, a much more successful movie, or just don't watch any movies and rely on the notes, or rely on your friend. It doesn't matter, you still have to know the notes. And so uh, here you have to be able to tell the difference between the APE and side. In fact, let me uh, just quickly go through them because we are, uh, yeah, we're close to, to the end. Um, uh, you do have to know, first of all, what is a charged tRNA, right? A charged tRNA is a tRNA that carries an amino acid. That's all you need to know. Right? An uncharged tRNA is, a, is a, a tRNA that does not have an amino acid. You have to know the enzyme that charges tRNAs. What are these called? Amino acyl tRNA synthetase. <coughs> you have to know that part. And the ribosome has three sides. It has A, P, and E. A for acceptance, or amino acyl, P for peptidyl, and then E for exit. So this is, again, stuff that, if you haven't come across to it, it sounds like totally weird material, but you do have to know it. <clears throat> and then, excuse me, so you do have to know the steps. And you have to know that normally the, the tRNAs are, sorry, uh, translation usually uses guanosine triphosphate, not ATP. So that is one rare exception in nature where ATP is not used GTP. Okay? So that part you do have to know. <coughs> and then you do have to know the steps, and I'll summarize them real quick. So I'm sitting in the ribosome, so to speak, and the messenger RNA is cutting across me. So you have to imagine the messenger RNA is coming across me. There are three sides. You can remember them whichever way you want, but you can remember them as the Environmental Protection Agency, or A. Regardless, P is the middle side. So P is the middle side. A is the acceptor side, which is on my right. And then E is the exit side, which is on my left. So what I'm going to repeat is exactly the same thing, regardless. The first tRNA that comes, this is the tRNA, this is the amino acid. The first tRNA that lands, lands where? In the P side. And this amino acid is always what? Which is always methionine. That's always methionine. In bacteria, it's formulated. In non-bacteria, it's not formulated. So mRNA is here. tRNA is here. This is the first amino acid. The second amino acid comes into what? The A side, right? That's why it's called the acceptor side. Now you have to remember, the first thing that brings it in is initiation factor two. This one is called elongation factor T. One way to remember them, EF2, get it? IF2, EF2. Two though is T, or temperature unstable. So now what do you have? You have everything in position to create the first peptide bond. This is the job of peptidyl transferase, which is not an enzyme, it's a ribozyme. So this is now what happens. If you imagine, everything's in the wrong place, right? Because now you have an uncharged tRNA where? In the P site. You have a fully charged tRNA where? In the A site. It's not in the right position. So now what happens? This step is called translocation, right? I've moved one codon. Now what happens? This is now where? In the E site it leaves. This is in the P site where it should be. And the next one comes into the A site. EFTU, peptidyl transferase, EFG for translocation. The next one comes in. 
Tick, and then tick. Now what happened? This continues until what? Until what enters the A site? Right, before the protein breaks. The A site. Stop codon comes in, there's no transfer RNA normally. Elongation factors can't come in. Release factors come in, break up everything. Um, let me finish actually with a problem that would, uh, would, that would kick it again, someone watch now. Um, let me use one where it summarizes everything that we've talked about. You do have to know that the beginning of the RNA is what end of the RNA? The beginning of the messenger RNA is always the five prime end. The beginning of the protein is always the, what, what is the start of the protein? Which letter starts the protein? The amino end or the carboxyl end? You have to know it's the amino end, right? So the amino end corresponds to the five prime, the carboxyl end corresponds to the three prime. Right? So let, let's start with this one to summarize everything. Oh, you do have to know also coupling, uh, direction of polysomes, etc. So let's do this. I'm going to uh, throw in a few letters here. Uh, a, C, um, C, uh, T, A, B, C, G, uh, T. And again, I'm going to modify it a little bit depending on what I come up with. Okay, I'm sorry, I threw in more letters than I needed to just to make sure that I cover it. Okay, so I think, uh, yeah, I think I'm right. Okay, so I'm giving you a double-stranded DNA. Here's the information. I am telling you that the start codon is in there somewhere. There's a start codon in there somewhere. Label the DNA. Label the DNA and tell me which is the coding, which is the non-coding, okay? So again, this is two or three chapters all together. So here's, here's the key. If you're told that there's a start codon in DNA, which letters will you be looking for? Remember, you're looking now for ATG. You have no idea where that ATG is, but you know it's gonna be in there somewhere. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna scan these letters, or these letters, and figure out an ATG. I'm gonna start with the top, and go left to right. Do I see an ATG? No, I don't. Let me start from the bottom. Do I see an ATG? No, I don't. And let me start from the top over that side and I'm gonna scan to see an ATG and I don't. I'm gonna start on the bottom and see an ATG. Aha, there's my ATG right there. That's my ATG. That's all you need to start with. Okay. Now, if you know that ATG is there, right, and you know that it's on the bottom strand, is the bottom strand the template strand true? Is, well, yes or no, I guess. Not true or false. Is the bottom strand the template strand? Yes or no? If you know that ATG is on the bottom strand. No. Because remember, it has to come off the non-template strand. Because ATG is the coding strand, right? If ATG is on the bottom strand, that means the bottom strand is the coding. Which means the top strand is the non-coding or the template strand. So let me label them. Let's me label them. And I think, yeah, we're running out of time. So if the bottom strand is the coding strand, right? What is this letter here? I mean, what is this number here? Is it five prime or is it three prime? Five prime, why? Because ATG always is five to three. So this is five prime, right? That's a weird prime. This is three prime. This is five prime. And this is three prime. So let's label it and then get it done with. What is the bottom strand? Coding. What is the top strand? Template. Template is non-coding, coding is non-template. 
And to prove it, let's prove it. And this will be the last uh, thing. Let's transcribe the sequence, right? Let's transcribe the sequence. If we're transcribing the sequence, right, where do we start with? If you know that this is the coding, right? You start out with the template. And you start out from which direction? If you're, let, let, let me finish with true-false question. True or false, given what we know, RNA polymerase is going from your right to your left. Meaning it's starting here and going that way, true or false? No, why not? It has to, it has to. It has to read this three prime end first, right? It makes a five prime. What is the first letter? T will come out as a what? A. A, A, A will come out as, no, U, G, etc. So notice it's the exact same thing as this guy. A, 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 all you need to do is replace the T's with U. And that's your RNA. Right. Remember, the coding is exactly the same as the messenger RNA, minus U's and T's. The template is the complementary to the coding. If you have questions, please come up. Again, please consider giving me your notes. Good luck. If you have questions, please come up.